Uh, looks like it's going to be hotter than yesterday. That rain last night didn't do much good. Brought out the worms. Look at this fat one. Ugh, how do you touch them things? It makes me all goosebumpy. What are you scared of? You? alone to talk. Don't run off now, Bert. Hello, Bert. I told you not to come here, Rachel. I couldn't help it. No one saw me, and Mr. Meeker won't tell. I keep thinking of you locked up here. You want to hear something funny? Food here is better than the boarding house, and uh, don't tell anyone how cool it is down there, or else we'll, we'll have a crime wave every summer. steamed up about Brady coming. He's coming in on a special train out of Chattanooga. Pa's going to the station to meet him. Everybody is. Strike up the band. But why can't you admit you're wrong? If the biggest man in the country, next to the president maybe, if Matthew Harrison Brady comes all the way here to tell everybody how wrong you are. You still think I did wrong? Why'd you do it? You know why I did it. I had the book in my hand. Hunter Civic Biology. And I opened it up to chapter 17 and read to my sophomore biology class Darwin's Origin of the Species. All it says is that man was just stuck here like some geranium in a flower pot that living comes from a long miracle. It didn't just happen in six days. But there's a law against it. I know that. Everybody says what you did is bad. It's not as simple as that. Good or bad, black or white, right or bad. Did you know that at the top of the world, the twilight, that six months long? But we don't live at the top of the world. We live in Hillsboro. And when the sun goes down, it's dark. And why do you have to make a difference anyway? Thanks, Rachel. Why can't you be on the right side of things? Your father's side? Rach, love me. I've seen 
Stadium was so, so at the Chautauqua meeting in Chattanooga. Oh, those tech poles shook. Who's going to be your lawyer, son? I'm not sure yet. I wrote to that paper up in Baltimore. They're going to send somebody. Well, he better be loud. Do you want me to go back down? What? No, you can stay up here as long as you want. I'm supposed to be in jail. I, I'd better be in jail. Woman up for you, Miss Cribbs? Well, the good Lord gave us the heat, and the good Lord gave us the glands to sweat with. I bet the devil ain't so obliging. I don't watch what kind of community this is. Yes, sir. Come on, Jesse, here. Big day, Reverend. Indeed it is. Picnic lunch ready, Miss White? Fitting for a king. Station master says old 93 out of Chattanooga's on his way. And Mr. Brady's on board, all right. Oh, the minute Brady gets off that train, the people are going to pour in. Why, this town will fill up like a rain barrel in a flood. That means business. Yeah. Where, where's all them folks going to stay? Where are we going to sleep, all of them? They got money. We'll sleep them. Looks like the biggest thing we've seen this town is put a cops in our Hey!
among you. We can only wish one thing, however, that you had not given us quite so uh, warm a welcome. <laughs> Bless you, my friends of Hillsborough. You know why I have come here. Not merely to prosecute a lawbreaker, an arrogant youth who has spoken out against the revealed word, but to defend that which is most precious in the hearts of all of us, the living truth of the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. I shall be happy to oblige Sarah. No, Mac, just you and the dignitary. Well, uh, you are the mayor, are you not, sir? I am, sir. My name is Matthew Harrison Brady. Oh, I know. Everybody knows that. I had a little speech of welcome ready, but somehow it really doesn't seem necessary. I shall be honored to hear your greeting, sir. <laughs> Mr. Matthew Harrison Brady. This municipality is proud to have within its city limits the warrior who has always fought for us ordinary people. <laughs> the lady folk of this town would have the vote if it wasn't for you fighting to give them all that suffering. Yeah. And Mr. President Wilson wouldn't have got to the White House or won the war if it hadn't been for you supporting him. <laughs> and in conclusion, the governor of our state has... Uh, Matthew, you didn't have your jacket on. Now, perhaps uh, we should have a, a more formal pose. Uh, who is the uh, spiritual leader of the community? Oh, that would be the Reverend Jeremiah Brown. Uh, your servant and the Lord. The Reverend at my left and the mayor at my right. We must look grave, gentlemen, but not, uh, not too serious. Hopeful, I think is the word. We must look hopeful. Hold it. And in conclusion, the governor of our state has vested in me the authority to confer upon you the title of honorary colonel in our state militia. Colonel <laughs> Brady, I, I like the sound of that. <laughs> we thought you might be hungry, Colonel Brady, after your train ride. So the members of our ladies' aid have prepared a buffet lunch. Splendid, splendid. I could do with a little snack. <laughs> Mr. Brady, Colonel Brady, sir, you know, most of us folks around here I voted for you for three times. <laughs> I trust it was in three separate elections. Colonel <laughs> Brady, I'm Tom Davenport. The circuit's district attorney will be a team, my good man. <clears throat> Quite a team. <laughs> ah, what a handsome repast. What a challenge it is to hit on the old armor again. To test the steel of our truth against the blasphemies of science. To stand once more yeah, in the dear. breach. It's a warm day, and remember, the doctor told you not to overeat. Now don't worry, Mother. It's just a, just a bite or two. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell me, who among you knows the defendant, Kate? Is that his name? Well, we all know him, sir. That's just about everybody in Hillsborough knows everybody else. Uh, can someone tell me, is this fellow Kate a, well, a criminal by nature? Well, sir, no. he isn't a criminal. He is good, really. He's just... Now, where's my child? Is Mr. Cates your friend? I can't tell you anything about him. Rachel, my daughter will be happy to answer any questions about Bertram Cates. Your daughter, Reverend? Well, you must be proud indeed. Go on, my child, tell me. How did you become acquainted with Mr. Cates? At school, I'm a school teacher too. Well, I trust that you teach according to the precepts of the law. I try, but my students are only second graders. Hmm. Has Mr. Cates tried to pollute your mind with his heathen dogma? For isn't heathen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I understand your loyalty, my child. This man, this, uh, this man in your jail house, is a fellow school teacher. Likeable, no doubt, and you are loath to speak out against him before all these people. Think of me. Think of me as a friend, Rachel, and tell me what trouble. Hey, y'all, who, who's going to be the defense attorney? Well, we don't know yet. It hasn't been announced. Well, whoever he is, he won't stand much of a chance against your husband, will he, Mrs. Brady? That's right. That's right. I disagree. Who are you? Hornbeck. E.K. Hornbeck of the Baltimore Herald. Hornbeck. Hornbeck. I am a newspaper man bearing news. When this sovereign...
sovereign state determined to indict the sovereign mind of a less than sovereign school teacher. <laughs> well, my newspaper editor decided there was more than just a headline here. The Baltimore Herald, therefore, is happy to announce that it is sending two representatives to heavenly Hillsborough, the most brilliant journalist in America today, myself, oh, and awesome. the most agile legal mind of the 20th century, Henry Drummond. <laughs> Henry Drummond, the agnostic? Oh, I heard about him. He's the one that got them two child murders in Chicago off last week. All right. Mr. Scottless man. A Merry Christmas and a jolly Fourth of July. Henry Drummond. Henry Drummond for the defense. Well, Henry Drummond is an agent of God. That's right. We want to allow him in the state. That's right. That's right. Well, I don't know by what law you can keep him out. Well, I can look it up in the town ordinances. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Yeah. I saw him once in a courtroom in Ohio. A man was accused of a most brutal crime. And although he knew and admitted that the man was guilty, Drummond was perverting the evidence to turn the guilt away from the accused and to put it on you and me, all of society. I can still see it, a slouching hulk of a man whose head jutted out like an animal. You look at his face and you wonder why God made such a man. Why? And when you know that God didn't make him, that he is a creature of the devil, maybe even the devil himself. <laughs> We won't allow him in the town. I think maybe the Board of Health. No, no, no. I believe that we should welcome Henry Drummond. Welcome him? If the enemy sends its Goliath into battle, it magnifies our cause. Henry Drummond has stalked the courtrooms of this land for 40 years now. When he fights, headlines. Follow. The whole world will be watching our victory over Drummond. Yes, right. Right. If, if St. George had slain a dragon fly, who would remember him? Well, it would be a pity to see them go to waste. Oh, <laughs> Don't worry, Mother. I have to build up my strength for the battle ahead. Now, what will Drummond do? <laughs> He'll try to make us forget the law breaker and put the law on trial. But we have the answer for Mr. Drummond. Right here is one of the things this sweet young lady has told me. She is a fine girl, Reverend, a fine girl. Rachel has always been taught to do the righteous thing. I'm sure that she has. Thank you. A toast, then. A toast to tomorrow, to the beginning of the trial and the success of our cause. A toast and good American lemonade. Yeah. 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 Mr. Mayor, it's time for Mr. Brady's nap. He always likes a nap after he's had a meal. <laughs> we have a sweet reserve for you over at the Madison House. I think you'll find your bags already there. Very thoughtful, consider. Well, if you'll come along with me, it's uh, it's only across the square. Now, I want to thank all the members of the Ladies' Aid for preparing this nice little picnic repast. <laughs> and uh, if I seem to pick at my food, I don't want you to think that I didn't enjoy it. But you see, uh, we had a box lunch on the train. <laughs> <laughs> it is good enough for Brady. It is good enough for Brady. It is good enough for Brady. journalistic camp followers. 
I'm scouting out an observation post to watch the frame. Wait. Why do you want to see Bert Kenny? What's he to you or you to him? Can it be that both beauty and biology are on our side? There's a newspaper here I'd like to have you see. Just arrived from that wicked modern Sodom and Gomorrah, Baltimore. Not the entire edition, of course. No happy hooligan born in Google, <laughs> Abe Kabibble. Merely the part worth reading. E.K. Hornbeck's brilliant little symphony of words. You really should read it. My typewriter's been singing a sweet, sad song about the Hillsboro heretic, B. Cates, boy Socrates, Latter-day Dreyfus, Romeo with a biology book. <laughs> I may be rancid butter, but I'm on your side of the bread. This sounds as if you're a friend of Bert's. As much as a critic can be a friend to anyone. <laughs> Have a bite? Don't worry. I'm not the serpent, little Eva. This isn't from the tree of knowledge. You certainly won't find one in the orchards of heavenly Hillsboro. Beaches, birches, butternuts. A few ignorance bushes, but no tree of knowledge. Will this be published here, in the local paper? <laughs> in the weekly bugle, or whatever it is they call the lead and stuff they blow through the local linotype? I doubt it. But it would help Bert if everybody could read this. It would help them understand. You know, I never would have expected you to write something like this. You seem so... Cynical? That's my fascination. I do hateful things for which people love me, and lovable things for which they hate me. I am the friend of enemies, the enemy of friends. I am admired for my detestability. I am both poles and the equator, with no temperate zones in between. You make it sound as if, as if Bert is a hero. I'd like to think that, but I can't. A teacher is a public servant. I feel that they should do what the school board and the law want them to do. If the superintendent comes up to me and says, Miss Brown, you're to teach from Whitley's second reader, I don't feel I have to give him an argument. Ever give your pupils a snap quiz on existence? What? Where we are, where we came from, where we're going. All the answers to those questions are in the Bible. All? You mean you feed the youth of Hillsboro from the little truck garden of your mind? I think there must be something wrong with what Bert believes. If a great man like Mr. Brady comes to speak out against Matthew Harrison Brady came here to find himself a stump to shout from, that's all. You couldn't understand. Mr. Brady is the champion of ordinary people, like us. Wake up, Sleeping Beauty. The ordinary people played a dirty trick on Colonel Brady. They ceased to exist. Time was when Brady was the hero of the hinterland, water boy for the great unwashed. Uh -huh. But they've got inside plumbing in their heads these days. There's a highway through the backwoods now, and the trees of the forest have reluctantly made way for their leafless cousins, the telephone poles. Henry's Lizzie rattles into town and leaves behind the yesterday messiah, standing in the road alone in a cloud of flibber dust. The boob has been deboobed. Colonel Brady's virginal small channer has been hacked. By Marconi and Montgomery Ward. <laughs> sure you don't want a bite? Awful good. It's going to be a hot night, Miss McClain. Thought we'd get some early when the sun went down.
attend church regularly, Mr. Bannister? Only on Sundays. <laughs> That's good enough for the prosecution, Your Honor. We will accept this man as a member of the jury. One moment, Mr. Bannister. You're not excused. The judge, I wanted this seat on the front row so I could see. Well, hold your horse, Mr. Bannister. You may get back yet. Mr. Drummond, you may examine the Venari man. Thank you, Your Honor. Bannister, I come here so anxious to get that front seat over there. Well, everybody says that this is going to be quite a show, and I want to be sure I can see it. <laughs> I hear the same thing. Now tell me, have you ever read anything in a book about evolution? Nope. Or about a fellow named Charles Darwin? Can't say that I have. I bet you read your Bible. Nope. How come? I can't read. <laughs> well, you are fortunate. He'll do. Take your seat, Mr. Bannister. Mr. Meeker, please call the Venari man to fill the twelfth and final seat on the jury. Your Honor, now, before we proceed, or will the court entertain a motion on a matter of procedure? Will the learned prosecutor state the motion? Uh, Jesse H. Dunlap, you're next, Jesse. <coughs> it has been brought to my attention that it is 97 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, it may get hotter. <laughs> I do not fear that the dignity of the court will suffer if we were to remove a few superfluous outer garments. Does the defense object to Colonel Brady's motion? I don't know if the dignity of the court can be upheld with these galluses I've got on. Well, we'll take that chance, Mr. Drummond. Those who wish to do so may remove their coats. <laughs> Does the defense attorney, are you showing us the latest fashions from the great metropolitan city of Chicago? I am glad you asked me that. I brought these along special. It just so happens that I bought these galluses at Peabody's General Store in your hometown, Mr. Brady. Weeping water in the brass. <laughs> Let us proceed with the selection of the final juror. State your name and occupation. Jesse H. Dunlap, farmer and a cabinet maker. Mr. Dunlap, do you believe in the Bible? I believe in the Holy Word of God, and I believe in Matthew Harrison Brady. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. You made it susceptible to the prosecution, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Trump. No questions. Not acceptable. <laughs> this, Mr. Drummond refused this man a place on the jury simply because he believes in the Bible. If you can find an evolutionist in this town, you can refuse him. Your Honor, I object to the defense rejecting a worthy citizen without so much as asking him a question. All right. I'll ask you a question. How are you? Uh, kind of hot. So am I. Excuse. <laughs> You're excused from jury duty, Mr. Dunlap. You may step down. I object to the note of liberty which counsel for the defense is injecting into these proceedings. <clears throat> the, the bench agrees with you in spirit, Colonel Brady. And I object to all this damn colonel talk. I am not familiar with Mr. Brady's military record. Well, he was made an honorary colonel in our state militia the day he arrived in Hillsborough. The use of this title prejudices the case of my client. It, it calls up a picture of a military colonel a, a stride of a white horse, a blaze in the uniform of a militia colonel with all the forces of might and righteousness marshaled behind him. Well, what are we to do? Break it. Make him a private. I have no particular objection to the title of Private Brady. Well, I can't take it back. By the power invested in me, I'm sure the governor won't have any objections. I hereby appoint you, Mr. Drummond, a temporary honorary colonel in the state militia. <laughs> Gentlemen, I do not know what to say. It, it 
it's not often in a man's lifetime that he attains the exalted rank of temporary honorary <laughs> colonel. Oh, it'll be made permanent, of course, pending proper papers on the governor's signature. I thank you. Colonel Brady, uh, Colonel Drummond, uh, please examine the binary man. State your name and occupation. Uh, George Sivers. I, I work down at the feed store. Tell me, sir, would you consider yourself a religious man? Well, I reckon I'm as religious as the next feller. Well, in Hillsborough, sir, that means a great deal. <laughs> Tell me, do you have any children, Mr. Sillers? Oh, uh, not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> and if you did have a son, Mr. Sillers, or a daughter, what would you think? If that sweet child came home from school and told you that a godless teacher... Objection, Your Honor. We are supposed to be selecting jury members. The prosecution is denouncing the defendant before the trial has even begun. Uh, objection sustained. <laughs> Mr. Sellers, do you have any personal opinions with regard to the defendant that might prejudice you on his behalf? Kate? Uh, I don't hardly know him. Oh. He did buy some peat moss from me, though, one time, and he did pay his bill. <laughs> Mr. Sillers impresses me as an honest, God-fearing man. I accept it. Thank you, Colonel Brady. Colonel Brown. Mr. Sillers, I just heard you say that um, you were a religious man. Tell me something. Are you working very hard at it? I'm working pretty hard down at the feed store. Uh, my wife tends to the religion for both of us. In other words, you take care of this life and your wife takes care of the next one. <laughs> Objection. Objection sustained. Now, Mr. Sillers, while your wife is tending to the religion, did you ever happen to run into a fellow named Charles Darwin? Not till recent. Well, from what you've heard about this Darwin fellow, you figure what, your wife would like to have him over for Sunday dinner? <laughs> is perfectly able to handle his own arguments. Look, I have just established that Mr. Sillis here isn't working very hard at religion. Now, for your sake, I'd like to establish that he's not working very hard at evolution. Well, I'm just working down at the feed store. <laughs> <laughs> this man's all right. Take a box seat, Mr. Sillis. I am not altogether satisfied that Mr. Sillis will render impartial judgment in this trial. Out of order, the prosecution has already accepted this man. I want a fair trial. So do I. Well, unless the state of mind of the members of the jury conform to the laws and patterns conform, of society. Conform? What do you want to do? Run the jury through a meat grinder so they all come out the same? Yeah. I have seen what you can do to a jury. Twist and tangle them. Nobody has forgotten the Endicott publishing case where you made the jury believe that the obscenity was in their own minds and not on the printed page. It was horrible what you did to that jury. Tricking them. Judgment by confusion. Think you can get away with that here? All I want is to prevent you clock stoppers from dumping a load of medieval nonsense into the United States Constitution. <laughs> Mrs. Brady has all 
autograph car. Uh, bless you, Mr. Freddy, for what you're doing. Bless you. You'll come to us for supper tonight, Colonel, in the Sunday school room, and afterwards, naturally, we'll expect you to attend our prayer meeting. Yes, yes, fine. Excellent. That they send over some mail from the mansion house, and these letters will gladden your heart. Um, Rachel. Yes, sir. I don't know if it's legal what I did about that Colonel business. Don't worry, I don't think you'll get hit by a thunderbolt. Sometimes I don't know. I just don't know. <laughs> I don't think that I have a correct copy of the indictment. Oh, well, let me see it. Well, you've got an old one. Well, let me have a new one, please. Mr. Drummond, you've got to stop all of this. It's still not too late. Bert knows he's wrong, and he's sorry. Why can't he just stand up and say, I admit it. I broke a law. I'm sorry, and I won't do it again. And then everybody will stop all this fuss and, and everything can be the way that it was. Who are you? I'm a friend of Bert's. How about it, boy? You getting cold feet? I never thought it would be like this. It's like Barnum and Bailey coming to town. You want to call it off? You want to quit? Yes. People look at me as if I were a murderer. Worse than a murderer. Remember that... Yeah, that fellow from Minnesota who killed his wife, remember Rach? Half the town turned out to see him put on the train. And they just stared at him like he was a curiosity. Not like they hated him. Not like he'd done anything really wrong. Just different. There's nothing very original about murdering your wife. People who I thought were my friends look at me now as if I had horns going out of my head. Murder your wife, it's not nearly as bad as murdering an old wives' tale. You kill one of their fairy tale notions and they'll bring down the wrath of God, Brady, and the state legislature. You make a joke out of everything. You seem to think it's all so funny. Well, lady, you lose the power to laugh and you lose the power to think straight. Mr. Drummond, I can't laugh. I'm scared. Good. You'd be a damn... I'm sorry if I offend you. I, I don't swear just for the hell of it. You see, I figure that language is a poor enough means of communication as it is, and so we need to use all the words we've got. Besides, there are damn few words that everybody understands. You don't care anything about Bert. You just want a chance to make speeches against the Bible. I care a great deal about Bert, and I care a great deal about what Bert thinks. Well, I care a great deal about what this town thinks of Buy back his respectability by making him a coward? I know what Bert's going through. It's the loneliest feeling in the world to find yourself standing up when everybody else is sitting down, to have everybody staring at you and saying, what's the matter with you? I know, I know what it's like. Walking down an empty street, listen to the sound of your own footsteps. Shutters closed, blinds drawn, doors locked against you, and you don't know if you're walking towards something or just walking away. Kate, we can change your plan and forget the whole business on one condition. If you honestly believe that you committed a criminal act against the citizens of this state and the minds of their children, if you honestly believe that you're wrong and the law is right, then the hell with it. I'll pack my bags and head back to Chicago where it's a cool 110 in the shade. Bert knows he's wrong. Don't you, Bert? Don't prompt the witness. What do you think, Mr. Drummond? I'm here. That tells you what I think. Well, what's the verdict, Bert? You ready to convict yourself before the jury does? No, sir. Bert! I'm not going to quit. It wouldn't bad enough anyhow. So if you'll stick by me, Rach, we can fight this thing out. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. What's the matter, Rach? I, I don't want to do it, Bert, but, but Mr. Brady says I... What does Mr. Brady say? They want me to testify against Bert. You can't. Ah, uh, Bert, I don't mean to rush you, but we've got a close-up shot, Rach. 
some of the some of the things I've talked to you about are just things you say to your own heart. But if you get up on the stand and say those things out loud, don't you understand, Rach? Some of the some of the things I've said to you softly in the dark about what the stars are for, what's on the back side of the moon. Mark. They were questions, Rach. I was asking questions. But if you get up on the stand and repeat those things, Brady will make them sound like answers, and they'll crucify me. What's your name? Rachel what? Rachel Brown. Can they make me testify? I'm afraid they can't. It would be nice if no one ever had to make anyone do anything. Don't let Brady frighten me. He always seems bigger than the law. It isn't Brady I'm afraid of. It's my father. Who's your father? The Reverend Jeremiah Brown. I used to feel this way when I was a little girl. I used to wake up at night terrified of the dark. I used to think sometimes that, that my bed was on the ceiling and the whole house was upside down. And if I didn't hold on tight, I might fall out into the stars. I wanted to run to my father and have him tell me I was safe and that everything was going to be okay. But I was always more afraid of my father than I was of falling. It's still the same way now. Is your mother dead? I never knew my mother. Is what they say about Bert true? Is he wicked? Bert Cates is a good man. He may be a great man. It takes strength for a woman to love such a man. Especially when he's a pariah in his own community. I'm only confusing Bert, and, and Bert's confused enough as it is. The man who has everything figured out is probably a fool. College examinations notwithstanding, it takes a smart fellow to say, I don't know the answer.
tell all of the readers of your newspapers that here in Hillsboro, we are fighting the fight of the faithful throughout the world. A question, Mr. Gray. Certainly. Now, where are you from, young lady? London, sir. Voices News Agent. Excellent. I have many friends in the United Kingdom. What is your personal opinion of Henry Jermyn? I am glad you asked me that. I want people everywhere to know that I bear Henry Drummond no uh, personal animosity. Now, there was a time when we were on the same side of the fence. He gave me active support in my campaign of 1908, and I welcomed it. But I say that if my own brother challenged the faith of millions, as Mr. Drummond is doing, I would oppose him still. Mr. Hornby, my clipping service has sent me some of your dispatches. How flattering to know I'm being clipped. It grieves me to read reporting that is so biased. I'm no reporter, Colonel. I'm a critic. Well, I hope you'll stay for Reverend Brown's prayer meeting. It may bring you some enlightenment. It may. I'm here on a press pass, and I don't intend to miss any part of the show. Good evening, Reverend. How are you, Mother? Reverend Brown was kind enough to escort me. Uh, Reverend, I am looking forward to your prayer meeting. You'll find our people are fervent in their belief. <laughs> I know it's warm tonight, Matt, but these night breezes can be so treacherous, and you know how you fix by yourself. Mother is always so worried about my throat. I always like to begin my meetings at the time announced. Most commendable. After you proceed, Reverend, after you. Of the word. Yes! Do we curse the 
Nicholas. Yeah. Yeah. Nick Shaw. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lord, we call down the same curse on those who ask grace to this center, though they be the blood yeah. of my blood yeah. and the flesh of my flesh. Yeah. We were uh, good friends once.
fell. Little bug slot in the water. And the little bugs got to be bigger bugs and sprouted legs and crawled upon the land. Well, how long did this take, according uh, to Mr. Case? A couple million years, maybe longer. Then come the fishes and the reptiles and the mammals. Man's a mammal. Oh, along with the dogs and uh, the cattle in the field. Uh, did he say that? Yes, sir. <laughs> now, how? How did man come out of this slimy mess of bugs and serpents, according uh, to your professor? Man was sort of evoluted from the old world monkeys. <laughs> did you hear that, my friend? Old world monkeys. According to Mr. Cates, you and I aren't even descended from good American monkeys. <laughs> Listen carefully, Howard. And all this talk of bugs and of evolution, of slime and ooze, did Mr. Cates ever make any reference to God? Not as I remember. Or to the miracle he achieved in seven days as described in the beautiful book of Genesis. No, sir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, objection, I ask that the court remind the learned counsel that this is not a talk to him. He's supposed to be presenting evidence to a jury. There are no ladies on the jury. Your Honor, I have no intention of making a speech. Well, there is no need. Everyone on the jury, everyone within the sound of this boy's voice, is moved by his tragic confusion. He has been taught that he wriggled up like an animal from the filth in the muck below. Now, I say, that these Bible haters, these, these evolutionists, are brewers of poison. And the legislature of this sovereign state has had the wisdom to demand that peddlers of poison, be they in bottles or in books, clearly label the products they attempt to sell. I'll tell you that unless this law is upheld, this boy will become one of a generation, shorn of its faith, by the godless teachings of science. But if the full penalty of the law is meted out to Bertram Case, the faithful, the whole world over who are watching us here and listening to our every word will call this courtroom blessed. Your witness, sir. Well, I certainly am glad. Colonel Brady didn't make a speech. <laughs> Howard, I just heard you say that um, the world used to be pretty hot. That's what Mr. Kate said. Figures any hotter then than what it is right now? Guess it must have been. Mr. Kate read it to us from a book. Do you know what book? Well, I guess that Mr. Darwin thought it up. You figure anything's wrong about that, Howard? Well, I don't know. You're right. to hand down an opinion on the question of morality. Your Honor, I am trying to establish that power. Or Colonel Brady, or Charles Darwin, or anyone in this courtroom, or you, sir, has the right to think. <clears throat> Colonel Grumman, the right to think is not on trial here. With all due respect to the bench, I maintain the right to think is very much on trial. It is in fearful danger in the proceedings of this court. Hey, man! is on trial. A thinking man, and he is threatened with fine and imprisonment because he chooses to speak what he thinks. Colonel Brown, please rephrase your question. Let's put it this way, Howard. All this fuss and feathers about evolution. Did it hurt you any? Sir? Did it do you any harm? What Mr. Cates told you, uh, you still feel relatively fit? What Mr. Cates told you, that it... Uh, Hurt your baseball game any? Affect your pitching arm? No, sir. I'm a lefty. Uh, <laughs> a sound boy. Well, you'll honor your father and your mother. Sure. Haven't murdered anybody since breakfast. Objection. <laughs> Objection sustained. Ask him if his holy faith in the scriptures has been shattered. When I need your valuable assistance, Colonel Brady, you may rest assured that I shall humbly ask for it. Howard, do you believe everything that Mr. Cates told you? I don't know. I got to think it over. Good for you. 
Howard, your pa's a farmer, isn't he? Yes, sir. Got a tractor? Brand new one. Now, you figure that a tractor is sinful because uh, it isn't mentioned in the Bible? Don't know. Well, now, Moses never made a telephone call. You figure that that makes a telephone an instrument of the devil? Well, I've never thought of it that way. And neither has anybody else. You're right. The defense makes the same old mistake of all godless men. He confuses material things with the great spiritual realities of the revealed word. Why? Do you bewilder the child? Does right have no meaning for you, sir? Realizing that I may prejudice the case of my client, I must say that right has no meaning to me whatsoever. <laughs> Truth has meaning as a direction. But one of the peculiar imbecilities of our time is the grid of morality that we have placed on human behavior so that every act of man must be measured against an arbitrary latitude of right and longitude of wrong in exact seconds, minutes, and degrees. Howard, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? No, sir. Well, maybe you will someday. Thank you, son, that's all. Witness is excused. Will Miss Rachel Brown come forward, please? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. <coughs> Miss Brown, uh, you are a teacher at the Hillsborough Consolidated School. Yes. And so you have had ample opportunity to know the defendant, Mr. Cates, <coughs> professionally. Yes. Is uh, Mr. Cates a member of the spiritual community to which you belong? Objection, Your Honor. I don't understand this chatter about spiritual community. If he wants to know if they go to the same church, why doesn't he ask that? <coughs> Objection overruled. He'll answer the question, please. Uh, I did answer it, didn't I? What was the question? Do you and Mr. Cates attend the same church? <laughs> Not anymore. Bert dropped out two summers ago. Why? It was what happened to the little Stebbins boy. Well, will you tell us about that, please? Well, Tommy was 11 years old. He went swimming in the river, got a cramp, and drowned. Bert felt awful about it. Tommy used to live next door to the boarding house, and, and he used to come over and look through Bert's microscope. Bert said the boy had a quick mind and he might even be a scientist when he grew up. At the funeral, Pa preached that Tommy didn't die in a state of grace because, because his parents had hadn't had him baptized. Tell him what your father really said! That Tommy's soul was stamped right in hellfire! Can't you see it? Yes, sir. Religion is supposed to comfort people, not frighten the dead! Your Honor, I ask that the defendant's remarks be stricken from the record. Well, can, can we strike this young man's bigoted dependence from the memory of this community? There is right. Go on, my dear. Tell the jury some more of Mr. Case's opinions on the subject of religion. Objection, objection, objection. Hearsay testimony is not admissible. <clears throat> The court sees no objection to this line of questioning. Proceed, Colonel Brady. Just repeat it in your own words. Some of the conversations you had with the defendant. I don't remember exactly. I don't know what you told me the other day. The supposedly humorous remark Mr. Cakes made about the Heavenly Father. <laughs> Go on, Miss Brown. Uh, Miss Brown, may I remind you that you are testifying under oath. It is unlawful to withhold pertinent information. Oh, Bert was just talking about things that he had read. He... Well, he... Well, well, were you shocked by these things? Describe for the court your innermost feelings when Bertrand Kate said to you that, that God did not create man. 
did he say about the holy state of matrimony? Did he compare it to the breeding of animals? You say that! And that's not what I told you! That's not what he meant! All he said was that... Was that... All he said was... Was... <laughs> Are you ill, Miss Brown? Would you care for a glass of water? Uh, I believe that, uh, <clears throat> that under these circumstances, the, uh, the witness should be excused. And will the defense have no chance to challenge some of the ideas that have been placed into the mouth of the witness by the prosecution? Don't plague her. Let her go. No question. For the time being, the witness is excused. <coughs> wish to call any further witnesses? Not at the present time, Your Honor. We shall proceed with the case for the defense. Colonel Brown. Your Honor, I wish to call to the stand Dr. Amos D. Keller, head of the Department of Zoology at the University of Chicago. Objection! What ground? I wish to inquire what possible relevance the testimony of a zoology professor can have in this trial. It has every relevance. My client is on trial for teaching evolution. Any testimony regarding his so-called infringement of this law must be admitted. Irrelevant, immaterial, inadmissible. Why? If Bertram Cates were accused of murder, would it be irrelevant to call expert witnesses to examine the murder weapon? Would you rule out testimony that showed that the weapon was incapable of firing a bullet? I failed to grasp the learned counsel's meeting. Oh. Your Honor, the defense wishes to place Dr. Keller on the stand so that he may explain to the gentlemen of the jury exactly what the theory of evolution is. How can they be expected to pass judgment on it if they don't know what it's all about? I hold that the very law we are here to enforce excludes such testimony. The people of this state have made it very clear. They do not wish this zoology hogwash slobbered around the classroom. And I, I refuse to allow these agnostic scientists to employ this courtroom as a sounding board, as a platform from which to shout their heresies into the headlines. <laughs> Agnostic scientists. Then I call Dr. Alan Page, deacon of the Congregational Church and professor of geology and archaeology at Oberlin College. Objection. Objection sustained. In one breath, does the court rule out the existence and deny zoology, geology, and archaeology? We do not deny the existence of these sciences but they do not relate to this point of law. I call Walter Erickson, anthropologist, philosopher, author, one of the most brilliant minds in the world today. Objection, Colonel Brady. Objection. Your Honor, the defense has brought to Hillsborough at great expense and inconvenience 15 noted scientists, the great thinkers of the world today. Their testimony is basic to the defense of my client. For it is my intent to show this court that what Bertram Cates spoke quietly one spring afternoon in the Hillsboro High School was no crime. It is as incontrovertible as geometry in every enlightened community of mind. In this community, Colonel Drummond, and in this sovereign state, exactly the opposite is the case. The language of the law is clear. We do not need experts to question the validity of a law that is already on the books. In other words, the court rules out any expert testimony regarding Charles Darwin's origin of species or descent of man. The court so rules. Would the court at 
testimony regarding a book known as the Holy Bible. Any objection, Colonel Gray? If the council can advance the case of the defendant through the use of the Holy Scripture, the prosecution will take no exception. Good. And I call one of the world's foremost experts on the Bible and its teaching. Matthew Harrison Brady. Your Honor, this is preposterous. Well, it's, a, it's highly unorthodox. I've never known of a case where the defense has called a prosecuting attorney as a witness. Your Honor, this entire trial is unorthodox. If the interest of justice and right will be served, I will take the stand. But Colonel Brady, the court will support you if you wish to decline to testify against your own case. Your Honor, I will not testify against anything. I will speak out, as I have my whole life, on behalf of the living truth of the Holy Scriptures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Meeker, you'd better swear in the witness. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. And he will. Amen. Now, am I correct, sir, in calling upon you as an authority on the book known as the Bible? And it would not be boastful to say that I have studied the Bible as much as any layman, and I have tried to live according to its precepts. Bully for you. Now, I suppose that you can quote me chapter and verse right straight through the King James Version, can't you? There are many portions of the Holy Bible that uh, I have committed to memory. I don't suppose that you've memorized many passages from the origin of species. I am not in the least interested in the pagan hypotheses of that. Never read it. And I never win. Then how in perdition do you have the gall to whoop up this holy war against something you know nothing about? How can you be so cocksure that the body of scientific evidence systematized in the writings of Charles Darwin are in any way irreconcilable with the book of Genesis? Would you state that question again, please? <laughs> All right, let's put it this way. Now on page 19 of Darwin's Origin of Species. You're on. I must object to this. Colonel Brady has been called as an expert witness on the Bible. And now the uh, gentleman from Chicago is attempting to use this opportunity to introduce evidence into the record that you, Your Honor, have already ruled as irrelevant. If he's going to question Colonel Brady on the Bible, then let him stick to the Bible. The Holy Bible and only the Bible. Colonel Drummond, please confine your questions to the Bible. All right. I get the scent in the wind. In your ballpark, Colonel. Now, let's get this straight. Let's get it clear. This is the book that you are an expert on. That is correct. Now tell me, do you believe that every word written in this book should be taken literally? Everything in the Bible should be accepted exactly as it is given there. Well, now, uh, take this place where uh, a whale swallows Jonah. You tell me that that uh, actually happened? Uh, the Bible does not say a whale. It says a big fish. <laughs> actually, it says a great fish. But that's pretty much the same thing. Now, what's your uh, feeling about that? I believe in a God who can make a whale. And who can make a fish and make both do as he pleases. Amen. I want those amens in the record. Now, I recollect the story about Joshua making the sun stand still. Now, as an expert, you tell me that uh, that's as true as the Jonah business, right? That's a pretty neat trick. You figure Houdini could do it? Have you ever pondered what would just naturally happen to the earth if the sun stood still? Well, you can testify to 
for that if I get you on the staff. <laughs> well, now, if they say that the sun stood still, they must have had a notion that the sun moved around the earth. Think that's the way of things, or don't you believe that the earth moves around the sun? I have faith in the Bible. You don't have much faith in the solar system. The sun <laughs> stopped. Good. Now, if what you say factually happened, if Joshua actually halted the sun in the sky, that means that the earth stopped spinning on its axis, and that continents toppled over one another, mountains flew out into space, and the earth arrested in its orbit, shriveled to a cinder, and crashed into the sun. Now, how did they miss this tidbit of news? Well, they missed it because it didn't happen. Well, it must have happened according to natural law. Or don't you believe in natural law, Bernard? Would you like to ban Copernicus from the classroom along with Charles Darwin? Pass a law to wipe out all scientific advancements since Joshua. Revelation, period. Natural law was born in the mind of the Heavenly Father. He can change it, cancel it, use it as he pleases. It, it constantly amazes me that you apostles of science, for all your supposed wisdom, fail to grasp this simple fact. Now, uh, listen to this. Genesis 4, 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. Now, where the hell did she come from? <laughs> Mrs. Cain, Cain's wife. If in the beginning there were only Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, where did this extra woman spring up from? You ever figure that one out? No, sir. I will leave the agnostics to hunt for her. <laughs> never figured it out. Never figured it out. No, never, never bothered you. Never bothered me. Figure someone else pulled off another uh, creation over the next county? <laughs> I have faith in the Bible. It satisfies me. It frightens me to think of the state of learning in the world, Mr. Brady, if everyone had your driving curiosity. Now, this book goes into a lot of the gaps, and uh, Brack said we got Sala, and Sala we got Eber, and so on and so forth. These pretty important folks? So they Now, just how did they go about all this begat? What do you mean by that? I mean, did they begat back then about the same way people get themselves begat today? <laughs> the, uh, the process is about the same. Uh, I don't think your scientists have improved it any. <laughs> so all these holy men and women were conceived and brought forth through the normal biological function known as sex. <laughs> What is your opinion of sex, Mr. Brady? In what spirit is this question asked? Well, I'm not asking you what you think of sex as a father or a husband or even a presidential candidate. You're up here as an expert on the Bible. What is the biblical evaluation of sex? It is considered original sin. And all these holy people got themselves begat through original sin? <laughs> All this sinning make them any less holy? Your Honor, where is this leading us? What does this have to do with the State versus Bertrand case? Colonel Grumman, the court must be satisfied that this line of questioning is pertinent to the case. You have ruled out every one of my witnesses. I must be allowed to examine the one witness you've left me in my own way. Your Honor, I will endure Mr. Drummond's sneering and his disrespect, for he pleads the case of the prosecution by his contempt for all that is holy. Object, I object, I object. On what grounds? It is possible that something is holy to the celebrated agnostic? Yes, the individual human mind. In a child's power to master the multiplication tables, there is more sanctity than all your shouted amens, holy holies, and hosannas. An idea is a greater monument than a cathedral. And the advance of man's pro progress is more, more of a miracle than, than any sticks turned to snakes or parting of the waters. But are we now to halt the march of progress because Mr. Brady frightens us with a 
fairy tale. Gentlemen, progress has never been a bargain. You've got to pay for it. Sometimes I think there's a man behind a counter who says, all right, you may have a telephone, but you'll have to give up privacy, the charm of distance. Madam, you may vote. But at a price, you'll have to give up the right to hide behind a petticoat or a powder puff. Mister, you may conquer the air, but the birds will lose their wonder and the clouds will smell of gasoline. Darwin moved us forward to a hilltop where we could look back and see the way from which we've come. But for this view, for this insight, for this knowledge, we must abandon our faith in the blessed poetry of gentleness. We must not abandon faith. Faith is the important thing. Then why did God plague us with the power to think? <laughs> Mr. Brady, why do you deny the one faculty that lifts man above all other creatures of the earth? The power of his brain to reason. What other merit have you? The elephant is, is larger, the horse is stronger and swifter, the butterfly more beautiful, the mosquito more prolific. Even the simple sponge is more durable. Or does a sponge think? I don't know. I'm a man, not a sponge. Do you think a sponge thinks? If the Lord wishes a sponge to think, it thinks. Does a man have the same privileges as a sponge? Of course. This man wishes to be accorded the same privileges as a sponge. He wishes to think. Amen. But your client is wrong. Your client is deluded. He has lost his wife. It is sad that we are not all gifted with your positive knowledge of right and wrong, Mr. Brady. How old do you think this rock is? <laughs> I am more interested in the rock of ages than I am in the age of rocks. <laughs> Professor Page of Oberlin College tells me that this rock is more than 10 million years old. Well, 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 Colonel Ruff, who finally managed to sneak in some of that scientific testimony after all. Look, Mr. Brady, these are the fossil remains of a prehistoric marine creature found in this very county and which lived here millions of years ago when these very mountain ranges were submerged underwater. I know. The Bible gives a fine account of the flood, but uh, your professor is a little mixed up on his dates. That rock is no more than 6,000 years old. How do you know? A fine a biblical scholar, Bishop Usher, has determined for us the exact hour and date of the creation. It began in 4004 BC. That is Bishop Usher's opinion. It is not opinion. It is literal fact, which the good bishop arrived at after careful computation of the ages of the prophets as set down in the Old Testament. In fact, uh, he determined that the Lord began the creation on October the 23rd, uh, 4004 B.C. at uh, 9 a.m. <laughs> the Eastern Standard Time <laughs> or Rocky Mountain Time? <laughs> It wasn't daylight saving time because the Lord didn't make the sun until the fourth day. <laughs> well, that is correct. That first day, was it a 24-hour day? <laughs> the Bible says it was a day. Well, there was no way to know. How do you know how long it was? The Bible says it was a day. A normal day, a literal day, a 24-hour day? I, uh, I do not know. What do you think? Well, I do not think about things that I, that I do not think about. Do you ever think about things that you do think about? <laughs> Isn't it possible that that first day was 25 hours long? There was no way to tell, no way to measure. Could it have been 25 hours? It is possible. So, you interpret that first day in the book of Genesis could be of indeterminate length. No, no, I merely mean to state that the day referred to was not necessarily a 24-hour day. In 30 hours, or a month, or a year, or a hundred years, or 10 million years. Oh, you're wrong. Right. This is not only irrelevant material, it's illegal. I demand to know the purpose of Mr. Drummond's examination. 
What is he trying to do? Well, I'll tell you what he is trying to do. He wants to destroy everybody's faith in the Bible and in God. That's right. That's not true, and you know it. All I want is to prevent you bigots and ignoramuses from controlling the education in the United States, and you know it. <laughs>
jury's still out, swatting flies and wrestling with justice in that order. <laughs> I'll hate to see that jury filing in, won't you, Colonel? I'll miss Hillsborough, especially this courthouse. A melange of Moorish and Methodist. Must have been designed by a congressman. going to happen? What do you think is going to happen, sir? Do you think they'll send me to prison? They could. They don't just ever let you see anyone from the outside. I mean, you can't just talk to a visitor through a window the way they showed in the movies. Oh, it's not as bad as all that. When they started this fire here, they didn't figure it would light up the whole sky. A lot of people getting hot shoes. But you can't be too sure. He seems so sure. He seems to know what the verdict's going to be. No one knows. I've got a pretty good idea. When you've been a lawyer as long as I have, a thousand years more or less, you get so you can smell the way a jury's thinking. And what are they thinking right now? One of these days, I'm going to get me an easy case, an open and shut case. I've got a friend in Chicago, big lawyer. Lord, how the money rolls in. You know why? He never takes a case that isn't a sure thing, like a jockey who won't go in a race unless he can ride the favorite. Well, you sure picked a long shot on this one. Sometimes I think the law is like a horse race. Sometimes it seems to me that I ride like fury just to end up right where I started from. Might as well be on a merry-go-round or a rocking horse. Golden dancer. What did you say? That was the name of my first long shot. Golden dancer. She was in the side window of the general store in Wakeman, Ohio, and I used to stand out in the street and tell myself, if I had Golden Dancer, I'd have everything in the whole world that I wanted. I was seven years old and a very fine judge of rocking horses. Golden Dancer had a bright red mane, blue eyes, gold all over with purple spots. When the sun hit her stirrup, she was a dazzling sight to see. But she was a week's wages for my father, so there was always a plate glass window between us. It couldn't have been Christmas. It must have been my birthday. I, I woke up one morning, and there was Golden Dancer at the foot of my bed. My mother had skimped on groceries, and my father had worked nights for a month. I jumped out of bed and into the saddle and started to rock, and it broke. The wood split in two. The whole thing was rotten, put together with spit and sealing wax. All shine, no substance. Bert, whenever you see something that's bright, shiny, almost perfect, look behind the paint. And if it's a lie, show it up for what it is. I think this will be the best place to put it, if it's okay with you, Your Honor. Now, there's no, there's no precedent for this sort of thing. You understand, sir? We're making history here today. This is the first time a public event has ever been broadcast. Well, I'll allow it, provided you don't interfere with the business of the court. Thank you, sir. Merle, I'll talk to you here. This telegram just came. Boys over at the state capitol are getting a little worried about how things are going. Newspapers all over raising such a hullabaloo that beginning to get a little nervous. After all, November ain't that far off, and it doesn't do any of us any good if all these voters get all riled up. Wouldn't do no harm to just let things simmer down. Go easy, Merle. Testing, one, two, three, four, five. Testing, one, two, three, four, five. What is that? 
Uh, it's an annunciator. You going to broadcast? We have a direct wire to WGN in Chicago. As soon as the jury comes in, we'll announce the verdict. Radio. God, this is going to break down a lot of walls. You're, you're not supposed to say God on the radio. Why the hell not? You're not supposed to say hell either. Well, this is going to be a barren source of amusement. Uh, kindly, one speaker to either side of this machine. Yes, sir, either side. Well, kindly signal to me while I am speaking if my voice does not have sufficient projection for your radio apparatus. to render its verdict in the famous Hillsboro monkey trial case. And the judge has just taken the bench, and in the next few minutes we shall find out whether Bertram Cates shall be found innocent or guilty. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a decision? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, Your Honor, we, we have. The decision of the jury is unanimous. Bertram Cates is found guilty as charged. Did you hear that, friends out there in Radio Land? Bertram Cates has just been found guilty as charged. I can tell you the confusion here is simply unbelievable. Now the next voice you'll hear right will be that of the judge. Excellent pronouncing sentence. You only thought you made the correlation of Charlemagne. Prisoner will rise to hear the sentence of this court. Bertram Cates. Your Honor, a question of order. Well, sir, is it not customary in this state to allow the defendant to make a statement before sentence is passed? Colonel Drummond, I regret this omission. In the confusion, I, I neglected the... Uh, Mr. Cates, if you wish to make a statement before sentence is passed, why, well, proceed to do so. Uh, Your Honor, I am not a public speaker. I do not have the eloquence of the man you have heard in the last few days, I'm only a school teacher. <laughs> Not emotionally! I was a school teacher. I feel I have been convicted of violating an unjust law. I will continue to oppose this law in the future, as I have in the past, any way I can. I. <laughs>
procedure is well taken. I'm sure that everyone here will wish to remain after court is adjourned to hear Colonel Brady's remarks. I hereby declare this court adjourned. Sign it up. Some other man will have to stand up, and you help give him the guts to do it. Mr. Baker, don't you have to lock me back up? Well, fail's been set. You don't expect a school teacher to have five hundred dollars. Well, this fellow over there, he put up the money. With a year's subscription to the Baltimore Herald, we give. Rachel! Hello, Bert. I won't need any shirts. I'm, I'm free for a while, uh, anyway. These are my things, Bert. I'm going away. Where are you?
you going? I'm not sure, but I'm leaving my father. Rach? Bert, it's my fault the jury found you guilty. Well, partly my fault. I helped. Here's your book, Bert. I read it all the way through. I don't understand it. And what I do understand, I don't like. I don't want to think that men come from apes and monkeys. But I think that's beside the point. That's right. That's beside the point. Mr. Drummond, I hope I haven't said anything to offend you. You see, I haven't thought very much. I was always afraid of what I might think, so it seems safer not to think at all. But now I know. A thought is like a child inside our body. It has to be born. If it dies inside you, part of you dies too. Maybe what Mr. Drummond wrote is bad. I don't know. But good or bad, it doesn't make any difference. The thoughts have to come out, like children. Some of them healthy as a bean plant, some of them sickly. I think the sickly ones die mostly, don't you, Bert? Brady's dead. Oh, no. I, I can't imagine the world without Matthew Harrison Brady. What caused it? Did they say? Matthew Harrison Brady died of a busted belly. Be frank. Why should we wait for him? He cried enough for himself. The national tear duct of weeping water Nebraska, who flooded the whole nation like a one-man Mississippi. <laughs> you know what he was. A Barnum Buckham Bible beating back. You smart aleck. You have no more right to spit on his religion than you have a right to spit on my religion, or my lack of it. Well, well, what do you know? Colonel Drummond for the defense, even of his enemies. There was much greatness in that man. Shall I put that in the obituary? Write anything you damn please. How do you write an obituary for a man who's been dead 30 years? In memoriam, MHB. <laughs> then what? Hell to the apostle whose letters to the Corinthians were lost in the mail? Ten years. No, two years. And then some tourist will ask the guy, who died here? Uh, Matthew Harrison who? What was that he said to the minister? It fits. He delivered his own obituary. Let's see, where is it? Here it is. His book. Uh, Proverbs, wasn't it? He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind, and the fool shall be servant to the wise at heart. Well, 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 Colonel Drummond. We're growing an odd crop of agnostics this year. I'm getting damn sick of you, Hornbeck. Why? Because you never pushed a noun against a verb except to blow something up. That's a typical lawyer's trick, always accusing the accuser. What am I accused of? I charge you with contempt of conscience, sentiment, kindness of forethought, Sentimentality in the first degree. Why? Because I refuse to erase a man's lifetime. I tell you that Brady had the same right as Kate's, the right to be wrong. Be kind to bigots, we. Since Brady's dead, we must be kind. God, how the world is rotten with kindness. A giant once lived in that body. But Matt Brady got lost, looking for God too high up and too far away. You hypocrite! You fraud! Why? Why, you're more religious than he was! Oh, excuse me, gentlemen, but I must get me to a typewriter and hammer out the story of an atheist who believes in God. Colonel Drummond? Oh, Bert, I am resigning my commission in the state militia. I'm handing in my sword. Doesn't an appeal cost a lot of money? I can't afford to pay you. I didn't come here to be paid. Well, I'd better get myself on a train. 
There's one out at 513. Bert, you and I can be on that train, too. I'll get my stuff. I'll help. I'll see you at the depot. Say, uh, you, you forgot...